Greetings from First Missionary Baptist Church, K Springs, Arkansas. My name is Ernest Lostavica. We'll be studying in First Peter, uh, verses 10 through 16 today. But anyway, what a glorious day we have today to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we have come to worship and to be in his very presence as a congregation. Uh, we are the body of Christ on this earth. We come together and what a privilege that is to be able to worship together as brothers and sisters in Christ with no outside influence. To assemble together, to read his word, uh, to sing hymns of praise, and to hear the truth of his word proclaimed. What a deal. And that's all God's doing. Our scripture today, of course, is First Peter. And we're looking at verses 10 through 16, and our theme for this fall study in First Peter is maintaining hope and holiness through suffering. Holiness through suffering. That is something that we have to, have to look at because we will suffer. The world suffers, yes, but they suffer without hope. When we suffer, we have a living hope in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will suffer with us because he has gone through it himself. So today we focus on the prophets of old who were told by God that a Savior was to come who would save mankind from their sin. The prophets that foretold the story of Jesus Christ in all their proclamations. And they said, so saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, this is what the Lord says, this is the commandment of the Lord, all those things were given to specific men that we call prophets who were told of future events concerning Israel and, of course, the world also. Let us pray that God would open our minds and heart to the hearing of the word as we begin uh, reading verses 10 through 12 to begin with. Uh, backing up a bit to the thought is receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, as we continue to look into your word, to have that privilege that even the angels don't have, the angels know it all, but they can't do anything because God says he's got a plan and we're going to be the ones responsible to spread the gospel. Lord God, we thank you for the prophets who laid out the history of the Lord Jesus Christ from eternity past to the present and to the future, all in that living hope that is Jesus Christ our Savior. Forgive me, Lord, my sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, when we read these, verse 10, verse 10 jumps right into it. It says, he's talking of the salvation the prophets have inquired in, of and diligently searched for. What else did the prophets do? Well, they passed on to the people what God said to them. God would say, go and speak, go and speak, go and tell them, go and tell the people what I had just told you. It was foretelling the future. Some of it was current in the time of the prophets and affected the nation of Israel in real time. The prophets would say, ye men of Israel, this is going to happen if you do not repent. This is going to happen even if you do repent. All those comments, commandments of God that apply to his people. Well, the prophets spoke the word of God, and then it occurred 
and the prophet was recognized as a true prophet because he could be trusted because the word of God came about. We remember well the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, but there are the 12 more prophets, and they all had a message from God foretelling Israel's future. And they all had their part in setting the stage for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and at the same time spoke of redemption and judgment. God wanted his people to always be aware of his spiritual presence, and that redemption was based on faith in him alone. They couldn't work their way into God's pleasure. They couldn't do anything except trust him, believe in him, and have faith in him. Yes, Christ was coming to save mankind, but he was to come first as the serving, suffering servant. He came humbly as a child, as a baby, and lived the life of a man, suffered all the temptations of mankind, suffered mentally, physically, bodily, in all ways, the scripture says, he was tempted even as we are, but he without sin. The nation of Israel was expecting something else. They were expecting a conquering king a king of Israel that would run out the Romans and make Israel a great nation again. Well, when they saw Jesus and his prophecy, they questioned and they, well, the prophets questioned God sometimes, and they suffered for it. So each, much of their prophecy was questioned. Let's read their problem and their faith in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 32 through 40 and what shall I more say he's talking to the Christians in the uh, era of this the dispersed persecuted church what more shall I say? For the time would fall, fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the enemies of the aliens, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What was that better promise that we received and the prophets didn't? It was the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. They prophesied it, they waited for it, but they didn't live to see it. Yet, we are very, very blessed to have seen, through the word of God, all the blessings promised and the future blessings that are to come. They've all been presented to us. We don't need prophets per se today because we have the whole prophecy here, 66 books of scripture, tells us everything we need to know in order to find the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal savior. Well, when we read this about the prophets, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 53 and see his work about Jesus Christ and his suffering. Who hath believed our report? 
This is Isaiah 53, 1 through 5. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The greatest prosophy that we see about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ upon this earth for our sake. For our sake, the power and authority was given to the prophets, yet they all suffered greatly. Yet the prophets also were given the knowledge of the risen, resurrected Christ, who overcame his suffering and now is coming, even in our future, as King of kings and Lord of lords. In Isaiah chapter 11, we see another facet of the coming kingdom that's in our future. This is very, very familiar scripture to us. Chapter 11, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. All these impossibilities are coming with the rule and reign of the king of kings. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming again, and he's coming in judgment, and he's coming to take his world, this world, into his kingdom forever and ever. So, all these things are here given to us by the prophets. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of the people. What was the first time he came? He came to suffer and die. The second time he's coming, he's coming to rule and reign and judge. Yes, the prophets and Moses told us much, and they suffered greatly, yet they rejoiced to foretell the coming of Jesus. Even in David in Psalm 22 describes the agony of the cross and the details of the crucifixion of Jesus. Yes, the prophets saw from thousands of years past, even into the future, which we look to ourselves in his second coming. We are beyond the cross and the resurrection. We see all these prophecies unfolded. Yet today, we need to listen carefully to the future prophecies of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the book of Revelation that tells us what's going to happen when Jesus comes again. Well, the prophets told of the grace of God, which is shed mightily on all who will believe. And it's come unto you, and it's come unto me. Grace, going back to verse 11, testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. And in verse 12, it was revealed not only to them, the prophets, but even more importantly to us today. All this is revealed to us today that we may know the Lord Jesus Christ preached to us by those appointed by God, not to foretell future things, but to simply foretell the word of God, which is complete. God has given us the past, he's given us the present, and he's given us information of the future. We have all the knowledge of Jesus wrapped together in the 66 books of the Bible. We no longer need prophets. 
We need professors of the truth of the Word of God, loudly proclaiming what has already been established in His Word. Verse 12 in part says, These things which are now with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. We have, as believers, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That holy God of creation changes our hearts and comes to live within us. Well, it ends in saying which things the angels desired to look into. Can you imagine the desire of angels in their mission to protect the Lord Jesus Christ in the mission to exalt and honor and glorify and worship the, the creator of all the universe, our God. And they're looking down on the earth and saying, I wish we could just go down there and grab him by the ears and say, listen, listen to what your God is saying. Come to me in the pulpit and say, speak louder, especially get with it. Stop beating around the bush. Lay it out plainly. Stop the flowery language and the droning rhetoric and preach Jesus, the only one who can and will save. But God says, no, the angels are not to do that. I want my elect, the chosen, to do it because I planned it that way. If you see 1 Peter verse 2, it talks about the elect says, this letter is to the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God knows it all, and he's chosen his men and women to carry on and do the job to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through his book, the Word of God, the Bible. Well, we move on to verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, gird up, take off your coat, roll up your sleeves, go to work, serving him no matter what the circumstances. Be sober. Of course, we're not talking just about alcohol and drug interference. We're talking about a serious mind uh, focused that God is the center of being and Jesus Christ is the main topic. Looking for that blessed hope that it talked about earlier. And that was expounded by the prophets. The hope of eternity with Christ is not a maybe hope. Um, it's, if we could compare it to a maybe hope, is I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I hope that it's a sunny day tomorrow. That's a temporary and a childish hope, but we have a hope that's sure and truthful, and it is there for those that find and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers should completely fix their hope on the grace of God. Our hope is that end, which is eternity, which here we see stated as the age of grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ is revealed to you, it's up to you to follow through. And then we go on to, well, without that revelation of Jesus, there is no hope. He is all important. And that grace Ephesians 2 and 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. He does it all. He chooses. He sees our faith. He saves us. And then he uses us by that grace. Moving on to verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. We serve as obedient children. We follow God's lead. We follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. We cannot serve God if we use the standards of the world or our old sinful ways. You can't go and spread the gospel saying, well, this is the way it was. This is the way I used to do it. This is my life. Something has to change. 
Romans 12 and verse 2 says it plainly. Be not conformed to this world. We have to be transformed. And he goes on to say, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Our mind has to be changed. Our heart has to be replaced. God says he's going to take the stony heart of the lost person and replace it with the fleshly heart of a believer. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, John 3, 7, Jesus said, you must be born again. That's what he's talking about. You must be born into the family of God. Uh, in our previous uh, study, in verse 3 of this chapter, it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again into a lively hope. We have been reborn by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply put, when Jesus Christ gives us a new heart, then that heart for God is no longer compatible with our old sinful life. You've been given a new heart, but our old sinful life will not support that heart. Praise God, I am what I am now, but thank God I'm no longer what I once was changed person, a new creature in Christ. Moving on to verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God told it to the Hebrew children in the wilderness. He said, This is what I want you to do. I want you to follow me and obey my commandments so that you would be holy like I am holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. That's a tall order. Human beings cannot be holy on their own. How can we as human beings be holy before a perfect and holy God? Well, God gave this command knowing fully well what we are, that we cannot be holy of ourselves. We have faith, then we are justified by that faith. We are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. When God the Father sees the blood, he declares us righteous. Righteousness is given to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ to be a covering of our sin. God no longer sees the sin. He sees the blood of Jesus. Then he sanctifies us, sets us apart, and the righteousness of Christ is impugned to us as believers. So then God instructs us to be holy. If we're going to carry the name of Christ, we have to show Christ. We have to exhibit Christ. We are to characterize Christ. We are to be Christ in this world. We are to be holy as he is holy. And it's before God, first and foremost, but also, importantly, before men, so they take notice of what it is to be a Christian. Not with arrogance, but with humility. We are to bear godly fruit. Godly fruit. Galatians tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, huh, meekness, and temperance. All those things. The next verse just simply says, if you live and act through this love, that there's no law against all that. There is no law against loving your neighbor. But there's a law against hating your neighbor, or despising your neighbor, or ignoring your neighbor. All those things, there are laws against. But absolutely no law of God that says to not love your neighbor. If we move on, these traits that we just enumerated, there are nine of them, they exhibit holiness. We are to be ambassadors for Christ. And how do we do that? In upright behavior in the world around us. To conclude all this information, um, the prophets prophesied the sufferings of Christ and in turn then suffered themselves. 
We today have the whole perspective of Jesus Christ and his salvation by the word of these prophets. Praise God for his unmerited grace that he would look down upon us with a love that was so intense that in order for us to be sinless, we, he had to give his only son to die for us. Praise God for the teachers and preachers who tell us today how to live holy lives. And the Word of God shows us the way of obedience. And His commands are simple. Prepare your mind to serve. Let your mind be transformed as long as, as, along with your heart. And then fix our mind. Fix our mind, body, and soul on that hope. To look to that living hope the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the living hope of eternity with Jesus is our reward. That's what it says in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There is the key. If Jesus Christ be not risen, we are of all men most miserable. The third thing is to live a holy life before God. Romans 12, 1 says, These things are our reasonable service. We become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. All these things apply to me and you. Are you suffering in this world today? Well, then you are in good company. The prophets were tested beyond our comprehension. Yet James 1 and 2 was speaking to the persecuted church, and he said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. How do we do that? It's by the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. So where was the proof? In Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and 41, when the apostles, apostles were jailed, and beaten, when they departed from that prison, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. When we have the eternal joy of living for Christ and knowing our eternal end, then no matter what happens in this world, we know it's temporary, and we count a joy that he saved us from it. We here in the Bible Belt are not suffering yet for his name, but we do suffer the curse of sin. No matter who you are and how much faith you have, the curse of sin is upon us. We do suffer physically, bodily, mentally, all those things. We turn to Jesus. He knows suffering, and he has been there. And he says, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. So he loves me, and he loves you. With him, we can rejoice in his hope of glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we don't like to suffer. Even your son was hesitant, yet he obeyed. He obeyed totally unto the death of the cross. Father, when we are tempted and tried and tribulation befalls us, Lord God, help us to turn to you to find the joy of the hope of the living God who rose again from the dead and will be with us forevermore. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.